Well, good morning to all of you. I invite you to take your Bibles to the passage that Lee read from earlier, Luke chapter 1. We are in the Benedictus of Zechariah again this morning. Um, I have not been out the last two nights for the uh, um, production of Herod the King, as I've been a little under the weather. But I was here Monday night and Tuesday night to observe it all in, in the dress rehearsal, and it's very good. And last night I was able to watch it online. And if you have not yet come, um, or even if you have, you're invited to come back. But uh, we hope you will come and bring someone with you. This is a very different production than any we've ever done before. It's a very, uh, a very serious, um, there's some humorous moments, of course, but a very serious portrayal of Herod and the kind of man he was. And uh, we, I think we understand through this portrayal that we'll see tonight that, that Christ came into a very, very uh, precarious and evil situation when he was born. And I think that magnifies the, the excellencies of the kingdom that Christ came to establish when you compare it to the kingdoms of this world, to the kingdom of Herod. So I hope you'll come and join us tonight for this final presentation of Herod the King. We're looking at the Song of Zechariah, traditionally called the Benedictus. This is our third message from this song. And some of you are saying, like, really? We're in this thing for three weeks in a row? Well... Actually, it's going to be four weeks in a row if you come on Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, because uh, there's so much here uh, in this incredible song, which was a prophecy of this uh, priest of God. He is holding in his arms his son, John, and he speaks these words while he's holding John. He has had John um, circ circumcised. This was the great event that the Jewish people would wait for on the birth of a boy. He has now received, John has received in his body the, the covenant sign that was given to Abraham, which would set him apart and distinguish him as one of God's covenant people. Zechariah is looking into the eyes of his son. He prophesies, being filled with the Spirit, and he speaks these incredible words. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago actually, we saw that this song is all about the saving purposes of God. It's a song of God's saving purposes. And uh, all through it, we, we have reference to this horn of salvation that God has raised up. Um, there's an intervention that God has made. He has visited His people, come to His people. There's a price that has been paid to free us. He has redeemed His people. And we understand what that price was. Ultimately, it was the blood of the Messiah himself, Jesus. And then, of course, the power to save us. It's, it's all God's from beginning to end. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Horn being the symbol of power. We don't save ourselves. It is God who saves us. And this salvation, this purpose of God in, save, in saving us, encompasses as well the erasing of all of the sins we've ever committed to give to his people the knowledge of the forgiveness of their sins. From beginning to end, Zechariah is telling us that salvation is God's work. It's not your work. It's not mine. We, we don't save ourselves. There's nothing that you and I can contribute to save us. It is by grace we've been saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of our works. There's no work that you can do there is nothing within you that earns you this salvation from beginning to end. Salvation is of the Lord. And Zechariah stresses this incredible point. The second thing Zechariah does is he points out that this is also a song of God's promises fulfilled. He makes reference to King David. He makes reference to Abraham. He makes reference to his son John as being the forerunner. And he points out that, that, that whether it's the seed of Abraham or the seed of David or the forerunner of the Messiah himself, these were all promises that God gave, that God would raise up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. David has an ultimate son. His immediate son, Solomon. His ultimate son, Jesus. It is through Jesus, the ultimate son, 
that God's salvation will be secured for his people. And as you read the Gospel of Luke through, there are these constant references to Jesus Christ being the son of David. Luke wants us to see that Jesus fulfilled God's promise to the letter. He is also the seed of Abraham, the oath that Abraham swore, uh, or the oath that, the oath that God swore to Abraham, the the covenant that God made, it's all answered, it's all fulfilled in Jesus himself. Now we come to our consideration this morning. And the question we want to ask ourselves this morning is, is what, what is the goal of this salvation that has been promised? Why has God saved us? Well, we, we can answer immediately and say, well, he saved us to forgive our sins. He, he saved us so that we could have eternal life, that we could be with him forever. Yes, that's true. But in terms of eternal life, in terms of the life to come, that's, that's the ultimate end. But why did God save you? Why did God save me? In other words, where does salvation lead? What is the fruit of being saved? What, what is the, the byproduct of having a salvation experience? What, what are the results of salvation? What, what is the purpose of God in saving us? And so we're going to ask this question and seek to answer it today. What will the Messiah bring to those who put their trust in him and follow him? And we'll see in verses 74 and 75 that this is a song about God's transforming enablement. Look at verse 74 and 75. On the screen it reads that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. I want to read now from the New International Version, which is, I believe, the version of of God's Word that most of us have. And I want to point out there's there's a word here that I want you to see. To rescue us from the hands of our enemies, or deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and to enable us to serve him. In the English Standard Version on the screen, it says that we might serve him, but it means to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. This is a song about God's enabling. God just doesn't simply save us from our sin and give us the gift of eternal life. God infuses into our lives a power that comes through Christ when we receive Christ as our Savior and, and Lord. Now, the, the, the perspective then of Zechariah on this is that the effect of the oath that God made to Abraham is not just deliverance from our enemies, not just the forgiveness of our sins, but an enablement. A a, a supernatural enablement that comes to everyone who believes in Jesus. There are three aspects to this. The first is this. The Messiah will bring about a spiritual transformation. Look at verse 74. And to enable us to serve him. Underscore those words. Enable us to serve him. This is what Jesus Christ does to the believing heart. When he saves you, he he doesn't just cleanse your heart of the defilement of the sin that characterized your life in the past. He doesn't just wash away the sin. He gives to your heart. He brings to your heart an enabling power. He liberates your heart so that you can serve him. Your heart has been trapped Your heart and your life has been enslaved, and Jesus Christ sets you free from that bondage and enables you to serve him. Now, here's a truth we all need to understand. Every single one of us in this room today, every single person on this planet is a servant of someone or something. You have been serving all of your life. Now it's true, when you were a little baby, uh, all the service went to you. But as soon as you started to grow and took on some responsibility in life, and as you've continued to grow in life, you know that your life is all about service. Are you married? You're a servant. That's not funny. It's true. 
When you pledged your vow to your wife, to your spouse, you pledged to serve, to honor, to love. You are a servant. When you go to work and you work for your boss, you are a servant. Everybody serves someone or something. Everyone does. Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said no one can serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other. You can't serve two at the same time. And in saying that, Jesus was making it clear that we all serve. We all serve. We are all slaves to someone or to something. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was addressing the issue of being a servant of God or being a servant of money. And by money, he, do, he wasn't just referring to, to, you know, dollars in your pocket. He was referring to the physical things of life, that which money gets you. And so many people are living just for the physical things of life. You think you're free. You think you're free because you have no restraints on your life. You can do whatever you want, you think. But you have given yourself over as a slave, as a servant, to the things that you desire. Those things control you. You are a servant to someone or to something. That is why Jesus said that whoever sins is a servant of sin. And that's what characterizes our life before we come to Christ. But when Christ calls us to come to him, when Christ calls you and me to believe in him, to follow him, something happens. We are released from our servitude to things and to people and to the idols of our own imagination and our own construction. We are released from all of those idols and we now begin to serve the true and the living God. In the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus arrives at the shore of Galilee. A group of fishermen are coming in off their boats, bringing their boats into shore. Jesus looks at them and he says to them, follow me. There's the call to be saved. There's the call into relationship with Christ. Follow me, he says. Then what? And I will make you fishers of men. Whenever Christ calls a person to himself, he doesn't just call that person to himself to enjoy a relationship with him. That's part of it. Thank God for that. But whenever Jesus calls someone to himself to save him, he then commissions that individual to become a servant. Jesus said in John chapter 15, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Now that's the salvation moment. That's salvation experience. God chose you. He brought you into fellowship with his son. You did not choose me. I chose you and, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. You are saved by God for the purpose of becoming a servant and a worshiper of the living God. Ephesians chapter 2, by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. You didn't save yourself. It's the gift of God. It's not by works, so that no one can boast. Next line. For we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. That's what God's done in us. Taken the mess and the ugliness of our lives and turned it into a beautiful masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works to serve him. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You can't put it under a bushel and cover it up. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. To the Thessalonian believers, Paul wrote, you turn from idols. You turn from those things that you worshiped and served to serve the true and living God. Whenever God saves you, he calls you to be a servant. That is the goal of salvation, as Zechariah outlines it here. So when God saves us, he delivers us from sin and its penalty, but he infuses into us a new purpose for living. He gives us meaning in life. It is to serve God. Is there any higher calling than serving God? 
And so Paul writes in Romans 12, in, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God has done for us in Christ, the great doctrine of salvation itself, in view of all of that, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your reasonable service, the Bible says. And so Mary then becomes the virgin mother of Jesus. She becomes, as it were, the first service, the first servant of this new age of grace when the angel appears to her and tells her she's going to give birth to a son. And she says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me exactly as you have said. There's a spiritual transformation that takes place through the Messiah. We are no longer the servants of this world and the servants of things, the things of this world. We have become the servants of the living God. Now, I want you to notice in the next verse, in verse 75, there's a, there's, there's a phrase here. In holiness and righteousness before him, underscore that, before him all our days. Verse 74, enabled to serve him. Verse 75, before him. You see that? Serve him before him. Now, I want to just stay on this phrase for just a moment. Next year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. In October 1517, Martin Luther, the Augustinian monk, nailed his 95 theses to a church door in a town called Wittenberg in what is Germany today. And that was the spark, so to speak, of this Reformation that took place. Now this Reformation, even though it was 500 years ago, has completely revolutionized the world in which you and I live. It was one of those watershed moments in the history of the Western world. Everything changed from that point on. We are living in some ways today in the freedoms that that Reformation brought about. Now, when this happened, Luther was protesting what was going on in the church, hence the word Protestant. His protest, and that of many others with him, was that they wanted to see a reforming happen in the church. The medieval church was, 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 was locked up in traditions which had nothing to do with what the Scripture said. The church was following the traditions that had been built up over the years so that, that the Scripture itself was no longer being followed. Now, in so much as the traditions were in agreement with what the Scripture said, that's good, Luther said. But inasmuch as those traditions are contrary to what the Scriptures clearly teach, there needs to be reformation in the church. And so he led this charge. What was happening in the church at that time, in the medieval church, was there was such a stress on sacred things and sacred places that only these sacred places and sacred things and sacred vocations had importance with God. In other words, what was really important for an individual was to go into a monastery. Like God takes notice of what happens in the monastery. But God is sort of indifferent to what happens in the marketplace. God is, is really concerned, and, and he sees, and, he, and, and, and it's sacred what happens in a church building, in a cathedral. But in the home, it's not so important. You see, it wasn't that they believed that God was not omnipresent. They believed in the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere at all times, but there was such a stress on the sacred places and the sacred things and the sacred callings and vocations that everyday life is not important. Everyday life is not lived before God. When the Reformers began to teach that we are justified before God purely on the basis of faith alone in Christ alone, that began to change everything. Because up until that time, it was like, I have to do sacred religious things in order to make this transcendent God come near to me. I can't, 
commune with the Holy One. He's too far away unless I change, unless I do these sacred things. But by being justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, that brought this God who is so far away near. That made God a welcoming God. And that began to change everything. Because with that mindset change, there was now a strong sense that it's not just the things that are done in the monastery that are important, but the things in the marketplace are lived out before God as well. And so there was a phrase in Latin which Luther used over and over again in his writings, quorum Deo, which simply means before God, before God. And Luther wrote like no one else before, before him of the fact that, that all of life is, is lived in the presence of a God and, and, and that our vocations in life are also sacred callings. It's not just the priest who gets called to minister in the church who has a sacred calling. The carpenter has a sacred calling too. It's not just the nun who ministers in the monastery, but the housewife at home who labors in the kitchen and works with her kids. She has a sacred calling too. It's not not just all these people who have these religious orders who are living their life quorum Deo before God. It is all of us who believe in Jesus. We are all living our lives before God. And that all of our vocations, therefore, are the means by which we serve God. Calvin talked about every dimension of life being negotium cum Deo, meaning business with God. In the kitchen, you're serving God. In your bedroom, you're serving God. In your workplace, you are serving God. And it liberated the people of God to understand that salvation enables all of us to serve God wherever God has placed us in life. And therefore, there is meaning to life. And that meaning to life is faithful service to the holy God. Zechariah is saying the Messiah has come to take lost people and to lift them up into the service of God. The Messiah has come so that those who once served other things could now begin to serve God, their creator. Number two, the Messiah would also bring emotional transformation. Verse 74, to enable us to serve him Next two words, key words, without fear. Without fear. To serve him without fear. Now, the English word fear is used in many different ways and often has different meanings. For example, in Proverbs, Solomon tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That means that's a fear you want to have because the fear of the Lord is what, is what changes your life and, 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 and begins to form your life and mold your life into wise living, living that is going to be beneficial for you, beneficial for other people. The fear of God, meaning the reverence of God, the, the awe of God. When you realize how awesome God is and you live your life before him, in his presence, under his, his glory and his holiness. It changes everything in life. It changes everything in life. And that is a fear we need to have. But this verse speaks of without fear. And we can come at this in two different ways. Sometimes when the Bible speaks of the fear of God, it is speaking of the fear of the impending judgment of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the book of Hebrews says. A very fearful thing. thing. Do you remember when Christ was on the cross between the two thieves? Remember, there was a conversation that went on between him and one of the thieves? Matthew tells us that both of the thieves were mocking Jesus at one point in time. Oh, if you're the Christ, save us! But Luke tells us that one of the thieves had a change of heart. And his words began to change. He was a thief who cried out to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was the thief who heard the words of Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. 
But before he said to, the thie- to his fellow thief, or before he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me, he said to his fellow thief, do you not fear God? We are getting what we justly deserve, but this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Don't you fear God? He understood that when we die, we face God. And that is somehow, sometimes, how the Bible uses the word fear. You are familiar with these words. If you've been a Christian for any period of time, you know the words of John Newton's hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to what? To fear. And grace my fears relieved. It was the grace of God that moved in my heart and caused my heart to fear the living God that I would fall into his hands and come under his righteous wrath. But it was also grace that relieved me of those fears when that grace brought me to Jesus and I understood that all of my judgment was taken away by the one who died on the cross for me. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. Zechariah is saying that because the Messiah has come, We who once lived with the fear of God hanging over our heads, the impending judgment that we deserve, we have been reconciled to him through the death of his son. And now, as the book of Hebrews tells us, we can come with confidence into the presence of God to find mercy and help in our time of need. That is the fear that the Lord lifts away from those who have trusted in him. But there's another thing that I want to focus in on. More along the emotional aspects of life, which is what we're talking about here. The transforming of life. Fear is a deep emotion. Fear is is perhaps one of the most binding things in life. Fear is a paralysis. When fear grips your life, when when you are consumed with certain phobias in life, you may have fears for all kinds of reasons, but whatever your fears are, you know that that brings a paralysis to your life, and you feel at times that you can't even serve God because you were so locked up in fear. Last week, a brother here um, grabbed me at the back of the church. It was one of the evenings here. There were a few people in the the auditorium. He grabbed me at the back. He said, John, I need to speak to you. We sat down in the back, the back row. He said, John, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely terrified about praying. I said, what do you mean? Are you afraid to pray? No, he says, no, I'm not afraid to pray to God. I I know God hears me. What I'm afraid is that when I'm in my life group, my life group leader, every once in a while, like he'll, he'll say to this person, will you open our time in prayer? Or another person, will you open our time in prayer? And I am living in fear that he's going to ask me to open my life, our life group meeting in prayer. And I just don't know what I'll say. I am completely locked up in fear as to what I would say. I can't pray. I can't pray and have others hear me pray. And so I, I said to him, well, let me tell you a story. And I, I told him a story about Rob. All of you know Rob. He's the chair of our elders team. And do you know that three years ago, Rob Captain felt the same way? By the way, I've got Rob's permission to share this today. He felt the same way. When he became an elder in the church, one of his big concerns was that he'd be asked to pray or asked to read or asked to stand in front of the church. And sure enough, Pastor Lee, one Sunday morning, said, Rob, I'm going to ask you to read this script, scripture passage. Rob said yes, because he knew he should as an elder. And then he called me back later, and he says, I can't do it. I can't get up in front of people. I, I can't get up in front of the church and, and, and read. And so Lee shared that with me, and of course, you know what I did right after that. I went after Rob. <laughs> we chatted, and we talked. And just this week, Rob reminded me of those experiences. And he said it was a spiritual issue for him. The first thing in his mind was, what gives me the, the word? Like, I, I'm, not worthy to do, I'm not worthy to speak for God. The devil had him all locked up. And we talked about that. And Rob said this. He said, the thing that released me from this fear was I claimed the promises of God. 
The promise he claimed was Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He said, I, I, I lean on the promises of God. I think of people like Moses who had all kinds of excuses that he could not speak for God. And when I think of that, I'm set free by the promises of God and the examples of people from the past. And now he leads our elders' meetings. He stands so often in front of us to speak. Just this earlier this year, he stood at the communion table and brought a devotional from God's Word for us to hear. I shared about Rob. And then I said to this brother, is that an encouragement to you? He said, yeah, it is. Does that help? Yeah. I said, well, let's pray then that God will release you from this fear. He said, fine. He bowed his head, and I said, okay, you pray. And he did. He did. You know what? It was a good prayer. That's the beginning of freedom for him. Listen, we can trust the God who saved us, right? Listen, if you can trust God to save your eternal soul, then you can trust God for anything in life. You can serve him without fear. Finally, the Messiah will bring not just the spiritual transformation that we might serve him, an emotional transformation that we might serve him without fear, but the Messiah will bring a behavioral transformation. The last line, verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. Now the word righteousness and the word holiness are sometimes interchangeable words. They mean the same thing. But there is a distinction between the two words. Holiness and righteousness. Let me get a little technical at this, at this point, and I think you'll find this helpful. Righteousness is my standing before God. I don't mean I'm standing before God. I mean my position before God. You, if you are a believer in Jesus, me who believes in Jesus, if you believe in Christ and he is your Savior and Lord, then you have a standing before God. And your standing before God is righteous. Through faith in Jesus Christ, God has given to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. You see, I can't stand before God. I have no position before God with my own righteousness. But God has given to me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2 says, Know this, that a man is justified not by keeping the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. God gives righteousness to those who believe in him. So I can stand before God righteous in his sight because the righteousness I possess is not my own. It is an alien righteousness. It belongs to Jesus. And Jesus has given it to me. Hallelujah. I have the righteousness of Christ. And so do you if you believe. That is your standing before God. But my pursuit the pursuit that is before me, the pursuit that is before us, is holiness. Holiness. I stand before God as righteous, but my pers the pursuit before me is holiness. Righteousness is what God makes me to be through faith in Christ, but holiness is what we endeavor to become. Let me put it this way. As a believer in Jesus, I can never be more righteous than I presently am. Because my righteousness is Christ's righteousness. And you can't be more righteous than Jesus. So I can never be more righteous than I am. But I can be more holy than I presently am. I can be more Christ-like than I presently am. 
righteousness is given to the believer in an instant when you believe. But holiness is something that is worked out in your life over the course of your life. The verse says, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. There, there's something there that's going to be there all our days. To put it in another way, the Christ who justifies us is the Christ who makes us holy. Listen, the eternal life that you received when you believed in Jesus Christ, you received that eternal life by faith. Whoever believes in me will not perish, but will have what? Everlasting life. Eternal life. The eternal life that you received by faith is, it is the life of the Holy Spirit. Not just the Spirit. It is the life of the Holy Spirit. It is the life of God that you have received. Only God is eternal. And you have received His life. It is the life of the Spirit. So the Spirit is within you, and the one who has given you eternal life is the one who lives in you, not just to cleanse your heart of its sin and to give you the gift of eternal life, but to transform you from the inside out so that you will become, over time, holier. You will become more like Christ as you seek to follow Jesus. I believe that with all my heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul explains it like this. He says, We all with open faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Now, what's he saying there? Well, he's talking about you and I in everyday life. He's talking about you and I in worship. When we worship, when we serve God, we, we're, we're looking, as it were, into a mirror, and we're looking at the glory of God. When, when we worship this morning, we sing about God, we sing about His glory. When, when you read your Bible, when, you, when, you're, when you're doing your devotions and you're, you're seeking to apply the Word of God to your life, it's like looking into a mirror and you're seeing the glory of the Lord. Well, there's something that happens when you look on the glory of God. You're like Moses. When Moses went up onto the mountain, remember, in that mountain experience, and he came down off the mountain and his face was just just beaming with the glory of God. It was radiating out from him. Like Jesus when he appeared in the transfiguration to Peter, James, and John. He, the scripture says he shone like the sun. Well, there's something about you and I living our life before God, open before him, confessing our sin, taking advantage of all the means of grace by which we will grow in Christ, the study of the word, prayer, and, and fellowship with each other in worship. When we're doing that, we're, 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 be, we're gazing on the glory of the Lord. And what happens? He says, we are being changed, transformed. The word he uses is, is metamorphosized. Like a caterpillar into a butterfly. That's the word. We're being changed from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. Listen, if, if, if there's no change in you from one year after another? If you're not growing in holiness, what's that say about you? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Because he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. The Holy Spirit is in you. He moves you. He constrains you. He's moving you in the direction of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Friends, this is what the gospel of Jesus does. The gospel of Jesus doesn't, believing in the gospel doesn't just free you from the horrifying future penalty of sin, which is eternal death. The gospel, believing in the gospel, also frees you from the present enslaving power of sin. You become more and more like Christ in time. Isn't that amazing? That's what salvation is all about. This is where salvation leads, that we might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Let me give you three quick takeaways then from this song. Number one, number one, Christmas is all about the amazing change that the Savior makes in our lives. Isn't that, isn't that true? You see, Christmas isn't, is, you, you know, we just think Christmas is like a little event that happened. Yeah, God became a man. Yeah, I know that's important and so on and so forth. No, no, it, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. He became a man, yes, 
to live a sinless life and to die a death on our behalf and, and to rise again to, to, to eternal life, to, to be transformed, to, be, to sit at the right hand of the Father, to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us. Christmas is all about this amazing change that the, that the Savior makes in our lives. Number two, Christmas is all about the transforming power that God injects into our lives through Christ. Christ is in us. Do you realize? Christ is in us. Christ is in me. Christ, is, Christ, to whom is given all authority, all power in heaven and earth, the very power of God in Christ, in me, in you. Hallelujah. Number three, Christmas is all about the glorious freedom that we can all experience through Christ. An experience of freedom. To be free from fear. To be free from everything that would hold us back from becoming what God wants us to be. Thank God for Christmas. Let's stand.